after leaving the World Bank, uh, Jacques um, went to the uh, University of Amsterdam, where, where he became the, um, uh, the dean of the uh, Faculty of Economics and Business, and subsequent to that has been very active uh, uh, here in the Netherlands, having also been the uh, co-founder and co-director of the Amsterdam Institute of International uh, Development. So I think Jack is very well known to you here in the uh, Dutch community, and he's also very well known to us in the uh, international community. Jack and I have uh, a bit of a common history in that we have both been sort of maverick in taking on unpopular topics. And I remember some years ago, Jack decided that he was going to prove uh, that the, um, uh, the critics of the uh, adjustment uh, period in the 1980s were actually wrong and that some adjustment could lead to good things. And so he did an analysis of what would happen 20 years after adjustment, who actually came out ahead, the ones who adjusted and who didn't adjust it. And that became quite, a, I think, a, a seminal piece because it, it challenged some of the, uh, I think, challenged some of the myths about what adjustment led to. And then uh, Jack and I also did something about uh, the cost of aging, uh, where everybody thinks that when you get older, it gets more expensive. But actually, the reality is that when you get really old, you don't want tubes anymore, and it actually gets cheaper. And so uh, we did some work on looking at what happens in the really you know, what we would call the fourth age when people actually get to the point where they're quite close to death and maybe don't want all the technology. So it's really, we're really delighted because putting that kind of a mind to development in particular the topic that we're talking about this morning, Jack, we look forward to hearing your presentation on uh, issues related to health financing and particularly insurance in uh, low income countries. Thank you, Alex. I haven't said anything yet. <laughs> Um, well, thank you very much for that uh, introduction. And now you guys know uh, where Sweda get his information about uh, healthcare costs and aging from. So, uh, Sweda mentioned it this morning. So, uh, very happy to be here. Um, and um, I knew that uh, Joop, in his introduction to this meeting, would speak about the hope that a meeting like this would come up with some of the answers. Uh, but when I start preparing this uh, little speech, I realized that I would personally be happy enough if I could get some of the questions right. So I hope you, you're not going to be too disappointed in what I'm going to say. Um, the, the basic uh, message uh, that you already heard also this morning is that there's just not enough money to go around. And um, how much money <coughs> should there be? Uh, well, uh, we know that uh, the Commission on Macroeconomics and Health, the WHO, in 2001 came up with an estimate that you know, if countries spend $34 per person per year, then for, for every person, then uh, you, could, you could actually build a, a basic healthcare system. Let's, let's make that $50 now in 2011. That's a nice round number in that order of magnitude. We also know that low-income countries, and I will speak mostly about low-income countries today, don't spend more than 22 or 25 so about half of what is needed, and then half of that total amount of $25 comes from the public sector and the other half from the private sector. So those are the kind of round numbers that we have to play with. <coughs> A lot has happened in the health field. Uh, health, uh, the health field has been extremely successful in, in uh, taking the front page, uh, getting attention, and getting large, large amounts of money, literally billions of dollars in uh, aid money, uh, 21 billion in 2007. The, uh, the thing that we don't see very often is that those billions and billions of dollars actually go to billions and billions of people. And if you start dividing billions by billions, you end up with very low numbers again. <laughs> so, you know, you can be happy that there's 21 some billion dollars for health aid available, um, but uh, that's only four dollars per person per year. So now if you're in a low income country and you have $25 in total, four dollars of that is uh, four and eight, um, you know, 11 some dollars is uh, regular public money and the rest is, is, is private money. But that doesn't get you to 50. How do you get to $50? How do you, how do you double that? Well, <laughs> there's an old truth in health economics that shows if you want to know how much a country spends on health care, all you have to know 
is how much income per head that country has. Uh, in this particular presentation, you find um, in, in the first column of numbers, see whether I can get this to work. You see that 86% of the variation in per capita income, uh, per capita spending on healthcare, 86% is uh, explained just by uh, per capita GDP. Uh, and th that, that is a bit of a problem because um, where, where, where did all that money go, right? You would, you would assume that if the government of a particular country gets a lot of aid or for other reasons is very focused on, on the health sector, value it very much, spends a lot out of public money on health care, then, then the total amount of money in the health sector does go up. Well, what you see here is that that is simply not true. Uh, the, the impact of the public share in total health spending on overall spending is precisely zero. So what that public money does, if the public sector expands, it basically replaces, it crowds out the private money. Uh, now, that is, that is true in, in general. This is not in general. This is for uh, actually um, 43 sub-Saharan Africa countries that, as you can see here, some of them, look at Rwanda, Uganda, Malawi, some of them actually have big shares uh, of uh, uh, aid in their public uh, sector, just health aid. Uh, we will see Rwanda a little closer later on. And still, that may have expanded the public uh, purse for health care, but you cannot find that it has spent, expanded total spending on health care. So you're kind of stuck where you expect the countries to be on the basis <coughs> of their uh, income levels, per capita income levels. Now, I can think about three ways to get to that $50, to, to get closer to that $50. The simplest one is economic growth, but I don't know how to kind of, you know, where to find that. Uh, and in fact, <coughs> um, but, but if, if countries grow, if they grow 10%, then their health spending goes up by 10%. So if you do that often enough, then you get to a level where you can actually build a, a, a halfway decent uh, uh, medical system. The other one would be much more aid. You know, we cannot expect for $4 per person per year on health aid to, to see major changes in the healthcare system. So you have to really pump massive amount of health aid into those countries to get over this crowding out situation. We will see a little bit more of that later. And when everything else fails, maybe we can, and somebody already said that earlier today, maybe we can do better with the available resources. <coughs> now look at economic growth. Um, we, will, uh, we will get stuck in the next 10, 15 years or so with, uh, with a group of countries that are just at the bottom <laughs> and they, they, don't, they don't get loose. It's the, uh, if we uh, now at this moment, I think there are 68 countries that are IDA eligible. IDA is the, uh, the, the, the cheap money arm of the, of the World Bank and only low income countries uh, are eligible for, for, it's almost grant money. Uh, in 2025, there will only be 32 countries uh, who will still be eligible for either because the other ones have graduated because their economies are growing. But those 32 countries are not growing and not for the foreseeable future. Vast majority is in sub-Saharan Africa uh, and then you see a number of countries that uh, are outside uh, sub-Saharan Africa. And essentially that's where Paul Collier's billion uh, poor will live forever. I mean, when, when we counted the poor in 1990 at the World Bank, we found about a billion. And in 2025, there will still be a billion. Now the world has grown, so the percentage of poor will have, uh, re has been reduced dramatically, but we still we have a billion people that are living on extreme uh, low income and consumption uh, levels. And how do you get <coughs> healthcare to those people? The, the countries are slow growing or not growing at all. They're fragile states, they're post-conflict. And so growth is not gonna do it at least for those people. 
I mean, if, the, if they still live on the equivalent of, say, $500 uh, per person per year, they will spend $25 on healthcare per year. I mean, that, that's just the way the cookie crumbles. Right? So, how, this, so growth alone for those countries definitely are not going to do it. So what if we start pumping really serious amounts of foreign aid for healthcare into those kind of countries? And here's an example. <coughs> Rwanda, it's post-conflict, we all feel bad about it, so it's a donor darling. Uh, at the moment it uh, shows some uh, uh, good governments, so countries are quite willing to step uh, forward and pump money in, uh, in uh, foreign aid in Rwanda. Um, one one uh, very interesting, uh, almost an experiment, but development, is the community health insurance scheme in Rwanda. Uh, that increased its coverage from 7% in 2003 to 91% in 2010. It did significantly increase health access, and uh, according to Oxfam, a staggering reduction in the under-5 mortality rate was one of the results. So, there you go. Not bad. But, <laughs> this is what happened. Health expenditures increased almost five-fold in a very short period of time. Largely driven by donor money. Very serious donor money. And the, the insurance fee for the community health schemes, at this particular point, only 5% of the $48 that's currently being spent on health care. Now, this is, on, this is about $500 a year per capita income, so my rule of thumb is that they spend $25 in a normal situation on care. You pump the aid in here, and you get it all the way up to almost uh, double it. Uh, so it's, it's doable. In the, in the meantime, by the way, uh, a lot of private money has been pushed out of the system. It's only 5%, and you know, it's more likely in a normal situation that it would be around 12 or 14%. Uh, 12 or 14 uh, dollars, I mean. <laughs> so it can work, it's very expensive. If you would do that for the bottom billion, right, then you need 25 billion a year, every year, with no end in sight. It's doable, 25 billion is not an impossible amount, but I can have a talk about this on the education sector too. And there are probably some other sectors that other people can knowledgeably talk about. And then it becomes a real big number for as far as the eye can see. Okay. So uh, it's doable, but it's unlikely that it's going to happen. So I think for the time being and for the foreseeable future, we, we have to start doing things like the type of stuff we discuss here. Can we do more with the money that actually is there? Can we, can we use it smarter? It doesn't make sense to let poor people pay out of their pocket and have to sell a cow or a tractor or whatever they have in order to go to the hospital, while the same amount of money that ultimately goes to the healthcare system by, in out-of-pocket payments can be harnessed in an insurance scheme. On paper, that is a very do doable exercise. And then instead of pushing the private money out of the system, you first put it in an insurance pot, and if necessary, you top, you top that up with uh, some form of subsidy. So <clears throat> what you need to do is to avoid that crowding out uh, mechanism. You can do that a little bit through various forms of conditionality or maybe matching grants, but uh, that is very difficult uh, to, to enforce. <laughs> and that brings us then to the question, is voluntary low-cost health insurance the answer? Uh, my first answer is yes, absolutely. Uh, and that comes from um, a series of studies. This is only one uh, done in Namibia, but we now have data from uh, at least half a dozen countries uh, about the willingness to pay for low-cost health insurance in, in those countries. It, it, in, in theory, it doesn't make sense, right? That every country, low-income country, <coughs> the government claims that our people have access to free medical care, right? Or highly subsidized public care. So to go in such a country 
and to ask an average person, uh, by the way, uh, if there would be uh, private health insurance, how much would you be willing to pay for that? Normal answer would be, guy crazy, I have free care. Okay? But the people on the ground know they don't have free care and that's why they pay out of pocket in, in, in private uh, clinics. So it turns out if you ask people whether they're interested in such a product, <coughs> 80 to 90% of the population actually says yes. In countries where in theory public health is available free for everybody. 80 to 90% of the people in those countries do want low-cost <coughs> private health insurance. So I've, in the political debates about, around these issues, I, I would like to have an answer to the question, if, if people do want it so badly, the vast majority of the population in those countries want it, why do we keep pushing the private sector out of the healthcare system? Why not provide the services and the type of, of, of services that people want themselves? <laughs> Furthermore, these kind of studies, we keep asking people not just whether they want something, because th that is easy, but how much would they be willing to pay for it? And this is, this is roughly what you get for answer. This is Namibia, and you will see that the poor are willing to pay an enormous percentage of their uh, current consumption levels on health insurance, but then they would starve. So this is simply not a realistic uh, answer. They, they, they need to pay for water, they need to pay for food, and that comes always first, and healthcare comes always uh, much, much later. But the middle quintiles, the middle 60% of the population, are willing to spend between 4 and 6% of their current consumption levels on uh, the premium for this kind of low-cost uh, health insurance. And the rich are clearly not interested, but they already have private insurance. So at least 60% of the population wants the insurance and would be willing to contribute 4 to 6% of their consumption level on, uh, in terms of uh, premium payments. That market is there. You can calculate whether 4% of the average consumption level plus the other half of the money, that is the government money, adds up to 50. It probably doesn't. That gives you an idea of how much subsidy you have to put on top of that uh, insurance package to make the system work. So the first answer, <coughs> and, and some studies around the first answer of the question, does voluntary health insurance provide you? With, uh, with a, a possibility to, to make improvements on the system, the answer is yes. But there are large problems in, in practice. <laughs> um, first of all, many of the attempts to, 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 to implement such a scheme focus entirely on, on insurance. But that is insurance for the same crummy health infrastructure that is on the ground, for the, for the same empty shelves in the same pharmacy uh, in the corner. So you have to do two things. You have to provide the financing, the, uh, the subsidies for the insurance and, and try to enroll people, but you also have to provide incentives and monies to improve the health infrastructure that is going to deliver uh, the services. In many cases, in this case I quote uh, Nicaragua, <coughs> um, that, was, that is simply not the case, and uh, those, those type of interventions uh, have a tendency to fail very badly. There is another kind of set of, whole set of, of issues uh, around poor people. Uh, they, they, they live from day to day, they have a very short time horizon, well, at this, if you want insurance, you actually pay today for something that maybe you need a year or two years from now. And so those time preferences are in the way to make it easy to enroll poor people in, in, uh, in insurance schemes that have a much longer um, time, time horizon. <laughs> the same issue really is on discount range. Something that happens today is important to them. Uh, it's often just a matter of you know, having food or not, uh, or being able to send your kid to school or not. Uh, something that happens in the future is just not on the radar screen. 
So the discount rate for things that happened, uh, for payments that may have to be made a long time from now, is, is, is very high. The other thing is, uh, risk is a fact of life. They, they, they risk droughts and, and tsunamis and, uh, you know, the, the, the yield of the farm doesn't, doesn't work. I mean, they, there, there's all kind of risk. It's a dangerous place where they live in. They are used to risk. We have insurance for everything. They have insurance for nothing. We try to coat ourselves with, with protections against all kinds of bad things that can happen to us. Those bad things that happen to those people all the time. The idea that you can protect yourself through some financial instrument from things that may happen to you somewhere in the future is pretty foreign to them. So that's, that's, that's an obstacle. Uh, you know, in, in the work we have done around the health insurance fund, a focus group, and it was not unusual to get the question, and at the end of the year, if I didn't, don't need the doctor, do I then get my premium back? Right? So that, that, that whole notion that, that, that you pay for the security rather than for the service is foreign to them. <laughs> so that was the bad, that makes it extra difficult to... to uh, now, the, the, the good news, as, as a nice, uh, I'm, I'm an economist, so I want to throw some jargon around. There's a nice uh, touch to it. It's called endogenous rationality. It really means that people uh, can learn. So that in the Nicaragua case, where people who consistently paid a, a big chunk of money on health care got the option of getting a highly subsidized insurance uh, package, still didn't take it, though they could have the package and still have more money in their pocket. So that was completely irrational from us economists kind of guys. But that was because they didn't trust you, they, they didn't know what it was, uh, the, the time preferences, the discount rates. But there is a body of literature now uh, that shows that uh, when people are exposed to more economic kind of environments, more competitive type of environments, then their behavior becomes in what we call, in a sense, more, more rational, more, uh, more economic, in that if they can get an insurance package and still keep money in the pocket uh, and be uh, sufficiently covered, they will actually do that. But that takes time. And I think it was already said earlier today, we have to do these kind of things, not to try to fix something today or this year or in the next two or three years, but you have to really talk in decades, uh, and or just maybe in just in terms of one generation. <coughs> Similar issues that I guess will will be talked about later. Um, people need to trust each other, uh, and uh, in order to pay for something that does not have an Im immediate uh, service attached to, or good attached to it. I have been pushing on this issue, um, but, and that, that relates to social capital. There are clubs, societies, cooperations, uh, marketplaces that are informally organized in those low-income countries. And I believe that we should pay more attention and, and try to be more experimental, a little bit more brave, and when we roll out the health insurance products, use the fabric of society. It is being done now in, in Kenya to a large extent where there is a dairy farm cooperation. The cooperation wanted the health insurance product. Uh, the, the premium that will be paid monthly will be deducted automatically from the money the cooperation owns the farmers for the delivery of milk uh, every day. So, so, so you use the fabric of society, you, you use that organizational framework to facilitate the rollout of the, uh, of the insurance uh, uh, product. I think more can be done around that. Uh, and ultimately, uh, I, I would like to push one more time for the notion of group insurance. Um, and uh, in, in which the group decide, and the group could be 100 people or 1,000 people, that they want the insurance. And maybe you can also then have the group make sure that everybody pays a monthly premium on time for that, for that insurance. 
but you avoid a lot of problems surrounding insurance, especially health insurance, in which either all the sick people enroll first and, and the insurance uh, company goes broke before it ha has a chance to start, uh, or there are free riders who insure only on the day that they know they have to go to the doctor and not an unusual uh, event. So just as it is relatively easy to insure all employees of a company, I think it is probably easier to insure a group as, as, in, the, uh, as in the dairy farm corporation than to roll out these insurance products uh, on an individual basis. So uh, the, the, the problem is, didn't go away. We still don't have enough resources. <coughs> and I think that is the problem that we have to, uh, we have to acknowledge. Uh, because it is insane to think that for $25 per person per head, you can roll out a halfway decent healthcare system. So there needs to be more money or we need to do better with the resources we have. The governments that promise that uh, uh, free healthcare for everyone, they are too weak uh, to make the traffic lights uh, work. And, and especially in the countries that I mentioned where a billion people in 2025 will still live under extreme poverty, those governments will still be too weak. So uh, you, we should not do what happens now too often as foreign aid agencies to ignore the private sector. It was said already, you cannot do this without the private sector. The crowding out issue is serious. So you need to find a way for the public and the private sector to work together. And no, we don't have all the answers. That's why we need to have uh, much more experimentation, evaluations, uh, try out new, new approaches. And somewhat by coincidence, I end with a there's a quest for public-private partnerships, which I think is the title of the next uh, speaker's uh, speech. Um, and I come to that because we just had a five-year, we, we had the wrap-up of a five-year uh, activities uh, of farm access in uh, Namibia, <coughs> which were uh, seriously evaluated. And uh, many, many good things has happened there, not in the least that uh, the relation between this private sector type of activities and the government has now been significantly strengthened to the benefit uh, for, for all participants. Um, so I would, I would call for uh, development aid to, to help the private sector rather than hinder it. And if we really want to be, uh, have, have an impact and have serious money, maybe you, we have to start thinking about either evolving the global fund or thinking about a new trust fund where both the public and the private sector can come in with new ideas and actually can uh, get them funded out of that uh, strategic uh, trust fund. And if that fund is big enough, then the first problem goes away. Thank you.